Good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to Plug In, your virtual connection to Tulane. Uh, tonight, uh, we're discussing return to professional sports, uh, the new normal. Uh, I am Dr. Greg Stewart, co-director and co-founder of the Tulane Center for Sport. Uh, our panelists tonight, uh, introduce them. Uh, first is Eric Beverly. Uh, he currently serves as the Director of Operations at the Tulane University Center for Sport, uh, where he oversees the daily operations of all center-related programs. Uh, he's a native of Cleveland, Ohio, and has a background in athletic administration. Uh, prior to his time at Tulane, Eric served as Assistant Athletics Director for Student Services at the University of Texas. Uh, and before arriving at Texas, he spent five years at the University of Georgia as Director of Academics for Football and Academic Counselor for Soccer. Eric played 10 years in the National Football League, uh, playing both offensive line and tight end. Uh, he began his professional career as an undrafted free agent with the Detroit Lions. Uh, after spending seven seasons in Detroit, he joined the Atlanta Falcons uh, before retiring in 2007. Uh, and had the uh, honor of uh, coming to New Orleans for that first game post-Katrina. Sorry, Eric, had to go there. Uh, Eric demonstrated his value and versatility on and off the field during his time playing in the NFL uh, by completing the Harvard Business School's NFL Business Management and Entrepreneurial Program. Uh, in addition, his professional off-season experiences uh, included internships with the NFL League Office, uh, Georgia Pacific, uh, as well as serving elected terms as a team representative uh, with the NFL Players Association. Welcome, Eric. Uh, next is Shelly Kayat, who is a Senior Vice President for the Cleveland Cavaliers Global Corporate Partnerships Department, uh, where she started with the organization in August of 2012. Uh, Shelly oversees the Corporate Partnership Department, including 40 plus team members, uh, that span across the Cleveland Cavaliers NBA, uh, the Cleveland Monsters AHL, the Canton Charge, the G League, and the Cavs Legion Esports. Her responsibilities include leading key personnel to drive brand campaigns and platforms for clients, cultivate new business and new business partnerships for the organization, as well as retain and grow uh, current partner revenue and brand strategies. Shelly comes from New Orleans, Louisiana, where she held positions in marketing, sponsorship, and community investment for the former New Orleans Hornets, now the New Orleans Pelicans, uh, for the last eight years prior to moving to Cleveland, Ohio. Uh, she didn't put in here, but uh, Shelly is also uh, a, a former Tulane uh, athlete, uh, women's basketball team, native of Louisiana, graduated from the A.B. Freeman School of Business in New Orleans with a B.A. in marketing and management, and currently resides in downtown Cleveland. Thank you, Shelley. Uh, Coley Edison uh, joins us. She's the CEO of the Professional Bowlers Association and Chief Customer Officer for uh, Bowler Oak Corp. Uh, Coley is responsible for the global marketing efforts of both Professional Bowling's Major League and the worldwide leader in bowling entertainment, media, and events. Uh, Coley joined Bolero Corporation in 2008 and has held director, brand strategy, and VP of marketing titles since then. Uh, in her first year as CEO of the PBA, Coley's worked to reinvigorate the sport uh, while reaching new audiences and engaging its thousands of members across the globe. She earned her bachelor's degree in communication from Tulane University. Uh, so welcome, Coley, to tonight. Uh, Dan Friel uh, is a 2004 graduate of Tulane Law School. Uh, after graduating from uh, Tulane, Dan worked as uh, assistant district attorney in Suffolk County in Boston and returned to New Orleans in 2007 to work as an assistant United States attorney for the Eastern District of Louisiana, where he prosecuted public corruption and white collar crime until launching TBT in 2014. In addition to his roles as TBT's co-founder and general counsel, Dan oversees all aspects of TBT's team relationships. Uh, he currently uh, lives uh, in New Orleans. Uh, welcome, Dan. 
And uh, Jennifer uh, Goldstein, who I had to actually do a little uh, work on. Uh, Jennifer graduated uh, from Tulane Law School in 1995 with a certificate in sports law program. Uh, she uh, interned with World Cup Soccer, uh, was editor in chief of the Sports Lawyers Journal, and is active in Sports Lawyers Association. Uh, Jennifer represents combat athletes, primarily UFC fighters and professional boxers, uh, as a partner with CAA's combat division. So Jennifer, welcome. At this point, uh, I am uh, happy to introduce uh, Gabe Feldman, uh, the director of Tulane Sports Law Program, uh, my co-host tonight, uh, and co-founder and co-director of the Center for Sport. Gabe, welcome as well. Thank you, Greg, and thank you to all our panelists. I, I just want to say for the record that I also started my NFL career as an undrafted free agent. <laughs> Didn't go beyond that, but Eric and I have a lot in common there. And I'm excited for tonight. We've got a, as, as you just heard, a really good group of panelists and lots of different perspectives to talk about in, in terms of how we return to sports, how we have returned to sports, what sports are gonna look like, or professional sports are gonna look like in the future. And I encourage everybody who's listening, if you have any questions, put them in the chat. I'll be following the chat and happy to ask the questions of the panelists as, as we go along. So let me start with Jennifer. And Jennifer, who has been a incredible supporter of the of Tulane Law School and the Tulane Sports Law Program and a great mentor for a lot of our students. And I have learned a lot from Jennifer. I, I've now known her for a long time. And so Jennifer, thank you for all that you've done and continue to do for, for our program. And thank you for taking the time to be on here. And I, I want to start by asking you to tell us a little bit about how UFC and combo, combat sports return to play, particularly given that UFC was the first organization to stage a major pro sports event in the U.S. post shutdown in, in March. And, and if you can talk a little bit about the, the willingness of fighters to return and the precautions that were put in place and how everything was balanced against the, the health risks. Uh, thanks, Gabe, and thanks for that. That was all too kind. Um, as you can imagine, fighters for the most part aren't fair to their physical well-being. So I don't know of any fighters who um, feared coming back because of the virus itself. There were several who were derailed because you know, their gym had been closed for the pandemic and they were in their garage, they didn't they make way, they felt like they had a full camp. Um, there were certainly those for whom coaches were older, unable to travel, or ill, um, they had been exposed, et cetera. So that took a lot of the fighters out. Um, many had never fought without their family or friends or particular coaches or corners there. And so that pulled out some fighters. Um, but the most part, I, I don't know that there were many fears of the virus itself. Um, U.S. would take credit for that. I, I think it did implement a wide-ranging uh, testing protocol. Jennifer, hold on. Jennifer, sorry, hold on one second. I just wanted to make sure this wasn't my. I think your audio is cutting out a okay. little. Is there? Can you move the antenna on top of the TV screen? Can you can you hear me? Is that, that better? That I think is better. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. Um, yeah, I, I don't think any fighters were worried as concerned about fighting because of the fact that we lost you again. Oh no. No? Still no? Let's try that now. Good? Okay. I think so. Um I'll just reiterate for those who couldn't hear that I don't think most of the fighters were concerned about a virus itself, but rather all the ancillary matters uh, that came from the pandemic. Um, you know, there was a structural change for many of them with regard to fight camps um, and their weight cuts, which were in many cases harder because they didn't have the same gym access and training access they previously had. The UFC did a lot of tests. 
Um, and for the first fight, they didn't get anybody isolated. Um, the first fight, fight in Jacksonville, everybody was just staying in an open hotel. Um, that was because Florida Commission allowed, when they moved to their own facility in uh, Las Vegas, where the Nevada Commission was more stringent. So at least in Nevada, there were actually fighters and licensed foreigners were all in the same place. All the same hotel, they weren't allowed to leave the vicinity of the hotel. Um, would pose its own problems because fighters opposing one another were staying in the hazard to get them back to the floor, but they'd still meet in the common areas. And because they were contained, it was, it was difficult. So somebody's saying I should disconnect. Oh, sorry, we just got another. Apparently, yeah. it's, it's the. Well, how about this? Do you want to try to. This is a good suggestion by Ruthie Bailey. Um, try to disconnect and reconnect, and then I'll come back to you. Perfect. Okay. All right. Sorry, everybody. Um, so let me let me go to Dan. And Dan is has also been a good friend and and a, a great supporter and mentor of a lot of Tulane sports law students. So all the nice things I said about Jennifer, I also will say about Dan. And and I remember I don't know how many years ago it was, but Dan I hadn't met him. He came by my office and said, "Hey, I want to talk to you about an idea. I'm working on with some friends. It's about a winner take all basketball tournament." sort of combination of American Idol and I forget how else you pitched it. And I thought, this is the best idea I've ever heard. Um, but, you know, you're an assistant U.S. attorney. What are you, what are you doing? And, and here he is. As the, it's, it's been incredible to watch TBT grow. And tell us about, you, you were, you had to do a truncated field. It, you had to change the timing. But it ended up being the show on on air because so few other sports were, were playing and you were on the ESPN networks. Tell us a little bit about how you pull off the TBT and there were so many eyes on you to see if this could actually happen. And before the NBA bubble, there was a TBT bubble. So talk about the decisions that went in there, how you pulled it off, the lessons you learned and just what it, what it how you go from being an AUSA to helping run a unique sporting event like TBT. You're on mute. The sound is perfect, but you're muted. Um, the uh, the answer to the first question, the last question first, I guess, is just kind of luck and circumstance, and you know, having an idea that a buddy of mine and I, that we've been friends with since we were 12, came up with. I mean, that's kind of the short answer to that part. Um, in terms of trying to pull off TBT this year, the thing that we put first was uh, trying to secure the event and make it health healthy and safe for everyone, and make make the players and the participants feel comfortable first and then worry about how the event would take place. So as the spring progressed, it became obvious that there was only one way to really accomplish at least any kind of physical contact sport, uh, which was gonna be under a, a quarantine. And so as we started to develop the plan, it became obvious that the structure that we typically would have, which mimics a lot, in a lot of ways what they do in March Madness, is to have regional events uh, in various locations around the country was just unrealistic. Um, it became too unwieldy to think that we could do four to eight uh, sites at the same time, both from a staffing perspective and a cost perspective, and uh, also the variability from one state to the other with respect to where they were in terms of their reopening, if at all, uh, where they were in terms of their viral load and all that kind of stuff. So what we started, started to figure out was it was obvious that we needed to be in one location to do it, and we probably made that specific call um, early May early to mid-May. I think May 15th was the date that we had in mind as when we were going to make that decision. And then from that point, it really was a mad dash to uh, find the proper location where we could actually implement all of these things we had been planning uh, over the previous, you know, three months. And so from that point, um, it really was a matter of just finding that, that perfect spot and being able to execute the way that we needed to. And we were very lucky, I think, in the sense that we had a lot of people involved that really wanted to do it. And that, to me, I think was the number one thing that allowed us to be able to play uh, those games over that 10 to 11 day period was the fact that we had 400 plus people from uh, TBT staff to players to coaches to the TV production crew, all of whom were under quarantine with us, um, that wanted to be there. You know, there wasn't any re reluctance or reticence. And part of that is, uh, you know, how our event is structured. 
Um, it's a winner takes all and it's elimination over the course of several months. Teams naturally weed themselves out. And so because of that, we were left with a pool of teams and players that really, really, really wanted to play basketball um, on a high profile stage. And so I think that really helped us a lot. Great. Thanks, Dan. And, and correct me if I'm wrong, but, but also the system was unique in that when a team lost, they, they left. Yes. They, they physically <laughs> yes. left the bubble. Yeah. So, so well, we, we had one hotel and we had everybody pack their bags. So before the game, everybody had to have all of their bags packed, win or lose. And the losers bags were brought to the hotel across the street. And I was, you know, I, I get the, the role of walking the teams back. We didn't use any buses. And so I was walking these loser teams back to the, to the we were stayed at the, uh, at the Hyatt and there was a Hilton across the street. And so the losing teams would go to the Hilton and their bags would be waiting for them there. They would literally, it was like literally, they would walk back from Nationwide Arena um, up uh, Nationwide Avenue on, in Columbus, Ohio, downtown Columbus, Ohio, and then walk in their full uniforms, all sweaty and disgusting <laughs> and irritated because they had just lost back to the Hilton and then their bags would be waiting for them back there. But that was part of our protocol. You know, that was both a, a health safety thing as well as a security issue is that when teams lose in our event, they tend to get pretty upset. Um, although this year, less more so than, any, than ever before, in my view. But um, we wanted to make sure that they had a safe place to go for themselves as well as everybody else that was involved. Yeah, it's incredible. Well, congrats on pulling off a, a successful event and, and doing it safely. Uh, let me go to Coley and tell us how the pandemic has impacted the return of the PBA and, and what changes you've made. And I'm also curious to hear as somebody who's at the top of the organization, who, who made the decisions? How much input did you receive from outside folks? And, and what do things look like now? Yeah, so thanks for having me and great question. So back on March 15th, we were actually in the midst of our World Series of Bowling live from Las Vegas. So we had thousands of people in Vegas because this is a multi-week tournament. Um, and then we were gearing up to be live on FS1 on Sunday. So it was a matter of, you know, by March 11th, when obviously it was really the day that everything you know, started happening between March 11th and March 15th, it was hour by hour. What are we going to do? Are we going to keep this going? Do we keep the players in Vegas? Do we send everybody home? You know, we had, so the way the World Series of Bowling works, I, I know you probably all know this, but I'll just repeat it anyway, um, is that we have, you know, the Atmel pattern uh, tournaments, which are like a chameleon pattern and the cheetah pattern, and then you have the world championship. So that's the big one. So what we decided to do was move that one up to Sunday when it was really gonna be on Thursday and we set everybody else home. Um, I was on one of the last flights out to Vegas. We did that tournament um, and then everybody went home and we really postponed the season. So we were actually the last live sporting event on Fox Sports, which is pretty cool. Um, this all happened six months after my company acquired the PBA and I had only been in the CEO position for six months. So I, I always say that we were on a roll. We, we really were. Uh, viewership is 50% up year over year. Um, and then it was really just about what do we do? How do we get back? So we're a little bit different than basketball or combat sports in that this is a no contact sport. Um, we're also very niche. So we're able to play around with our formats and find the best way to bring our products to the largest audience possible. So for us, it was about creativity and flexibility. We knew we could not do our large scale tournaments where we bring in thousands of regional players and then it ultimately goes into a stepladder final. And so what I did was develop two essentially made for TV events. Um, we were back on in June and we partnered closely with Fox Sports to get these dates and you know, we kind of saw this as an opportunity. I was able to do two nights on Big Fox um, on a Saturday night in prime time, which is really hard for the PBA to get. We don't get these type of windows. Um, so it was like, if Fox is gonna give this to me, I gotta figure out the best way to give them the best content and to reach our audience. So we ended up going down to Florida as Jennifer alluded to earlier because the governor there said, pro sports are an essential business and invited us to come down. Uh, Bolero Corp, um, as Dr. Stewart talked about earlier, is the parent company of the PBA. We own and operate 300 bowling centers. So we're able to go to one of my bowling centers, which was close to the public. Um, so there was a lot of factors in play. And then once we were on site, 
you know, we had only eight competitors um, for one event and 10 for another. Uh, there was no sharing of equipment. There was temperature taking before people came in, um, PPE, but we don't have the funding to do widespread testing that the MBA can do or, you know, MLB. So it was really about, you know, doing health screenings, temperature checks, PPE, and ultimately just limiting the amount of people on site. So really reduce crew, really reduce staff. Um, and like I said, the formats were just so that two players were on the approach at a time. They couldn't share equipment. Um, you know, there was no, usually they bring their friends and family. Um, there were no fans. The biggest difference I'd say though, from the MLB or the NBA is that fans don't contribute to our revenue. That's not part of our model. We don't need 40,000 people in a stadium. We usually have 200 people in a bowling center. So the, the, mist, the mist there was really the vibe, and we spoke to that by creating LED screens behind the lanes, on the side of the lanes, um, and so we just made it work. And to your earlier question, Gabe, the ultimate decision came down to me. Um, it was something that I wrestled with. You know, not only are we the professional, uh, you know, league of bowling, but we also do the regional tournaments as well. And so recently, I had set up one of our PBA 50, which is where our 50 and over bowlers are bowling and they were supposed to be down in the villages in Florida. I had 194 people registered to bowl the likes of Norm Duke and Walter Ray Williams Jr. and Pete Weber and I canceled it last week. And that was really hard because I know that these guys wanted to bowl, but I just said, you know, I can't live with that on my conscience of having 194 senior citizens bowling in a closed building and, and what might happen. So the decisions are mine to make, but it's not been an easy process. Yeah, thank you, Coley. That's that's really interesting, and it, it's it's um, it's remarkable the decisions that people have to make these days. And and um, I applaud you for thinking about the the safety of, of the athletes. And and I can't imagine for both you and for for Dan the the, the legal issues that are well beyond what we have time to talk about tonight. But but I just want to highlight one point you made that's that's fascinating is the different revenue models for different sports and how much particular sports or leagues depend on live attendance and ticket sales versus TV revenue and how that might impact some of the, the decisions that are coming up. Um, so on that note, let me go to Shelly and then I'll come back to, to Jennifer and hopefully Jennifer's Wi-Fi will be, will be better. But so Shelly on the, on the revenue question, um, tell us the impact that the pandemic, please tell us the impact that the pandemic has had on business development, corporate partnerships, everything you deal with from the Cavs. And have you seen a difference among the different sports that you, you work with? To, to Coley's, to the point we're just making with Coley that, that the PBA has different issues in terms of fan attendance versus TBT versus the NBA versus Major League Baseball versus college football. I imagine the sports that you oversee in the different leagues have different revenue issues and different corporate sponsorships and different needs. So can you kind of paint us the picture of how it's impacted the Cavs and then the other sports you deal with as well? Absolutely. Well, first of all, thanks for having me, Gabe uh, and Dr. Stewart for the introduction. It's great to be here with fellow Tulane alumni. Um, and so, you know, like I will reiterate what a lot of the others are saying of how the, the, how the pandemic has really impacted us right away. You know, I, I would say the biggest impact is that right when this happened, um, it impacted team members, right? For us, the date was March 11th. Like, it's, you know, kind of where were you on that date, right? We remember the NBA announced a player that was um, tested positive. And it seems like from then, when you look at across the country, like businesses started to shut down, schools, like it kind of was a trickle down effect. So that for us was very impactful. And we knew right away the biggest impact was on our team members, which then, by the way, impacts business, right? And so our decisions changed. Um, not that they, they weren't before, but really started to even more heavier, I would say, focus on team members. We were in the middle that day of a, a mid-American conference, a MAC tournament that was going on in our arena um, while we were in a boardroom figuring out how we were going to move 400 team members to work from home and making sure they had the technology and the resources to say when, hey, you're leaving. And by the way, we don't know when you're coming back, so make sure you take everything. Um, and, and we need to make sure you're okay. When you, get, when you get home in your space, do you have, you know, the proper computer and technology? And, you know, like, it's, it's a resource conversation at that point. 
Um, so that was a whole process in itself when, to be honest, we didn't even think about partnerships. We didn't think about the business. Like we really were just focused on team members. Um, so once I would say that got settled, you know, for us, luckily on the NBA side, we were on the back end of our season. So we were roughly 80% through. We had five Cavs home games left. We had about 12 road games. Again, we had some events, uh, concerts, Cirque de Soleil shows, the MAC tournament, but it wasn't a huge um, chunk. Uh, most of our home games were played on the front end of our schedule. There are some teams that still had 10 home games left, right? There was a lot more impact uh, than just five and so forth. So that was a, a big impact for us. Um, canceling our Monsters, you know, hockey season, you know, then the charge season. Um, for us, of those five games that were remaining was the Lakers and the Bucks. <laughs> um, so when you think of revenue sources, uh, that one hurt. <laughs> those two hurt. Um, and, you know, that's something that we had to, to, to manage and, and work from from there. Um, I remain, look, you know, to Coley, like, again, she's in a very, that part was, um, her revenue stream is, is better that you didn't rely on fans. For us, we need those fans because um, events is a big source of our revenue streams. Um, and so that was, that one, you know, hurt us. And uh, I'd say when you think of impact, the inability to see and engage with clients and new clients, like, you know, try talking to a prospect that you, you know, can't even see or talk to and how do you build a rapport and, you know, have a drink or a cocktail, like all of that, right, gone. And, and for how long, nobody knows. We were just focused on keeping people safe and in their homes, um, quarantined. So I think there was a lot of impacts in that space of um, revenue loss. Like those five games, all of, all of that meant revenue was lost um, or impacted, I would say. Luckily, um, we've been working with our partners very closely um, and we have great relationships. When something like this happens, you throw everything out of the window, you throw your contracts out of the window for a certain, from a certain standpoint and you really focus on relationships because we were just as focused as how are our partners doing because they were going through the exact same thing at the exact same time, right? So we're not, we can't talk about business. <laughs> like we, we want to make sure they're safe and they're okay. Um, and they're going through these processes and they're having to furlough their own employees. And we're at, you know, we, we're trying to get payments and, and partnerships. And so really it became just trying to be like from a humanity standpoint um, to approach every single partner differently. Um, we literally set up and called every single partner just to check in. We just want to know how you're doing. Where are you? Um, you know, and, and to keep in touch, that communication piece became very important. I think when you think of impact to the business, I would say there was also a lot of opportunity. Um, you know, communication. We, we had to get real creative on that. And I'm sure we all are now very um, versed with uh, virtual communication. Um, you know, our I look at over the last few months, we've been doing these wine tastings with prospects where we bring them and their spouses out in the evening and have one of our Cavs legends or uh, one of our executives to do just sort of a wine taste and talk. Um, and that, and they actually love it. <laughs> um, so it's been a way for us to engage with people that we can't go see right now. Um, so, you know, to keep, keep the business engagement going. Um, we've been delivering personal notes and masks and, uh, you know, things of that nature. But look, I would say the biggest thing for us right now is also keeping engaged. So downtown, there's not much going on, as I'm sure many downtowns across the country, um, right, with, our, with businesses closed. But um, we are look at our arena, our Rocket Mortgage Fieldhouse as a sort of a community hub to bring back the heartbeat of um, downtown Cleveland. So we've been actually over the last couple of weeks engaging in cornhole tournament, in camps and clinics. Um, and, um, you and guys want to, you want a bowling lane? I could bring one to you guys. <laughs> hey, Coley, we are open, so we should talk after this. All we right. <laughs> to a whole nother level right now. Um, and, and look, that's the thing. You talk about how's the business impact. Is it driving a ton of revenue? No. Um, but is it getting the movement back? Uh, and look, it's driving some revenue and, and keeping sort of the, the heartbeat and energy going for what's going on. Um, cause we're in a different world right now. So. Um, so yes, a lot of impacts to the business. <laughs> Great, thanks. And I don't know if there's a finder's fee for the bowling lane, but if so, we can we can talk about that later. But all right, let me go back to Jennifer. The the you were raised a really interesting point that that fighters want to fight, and fighters aren't by sort of by their nature very concerned about necessarily as concerned about their health and safety. So there wasn't as much concern about actual. Um, contraction of the of the virus and then you had started to talk about 
Florida and, and then you broke up. So let me kick it back yeah. over to you and fingers crossed that the connection's good. I apologize. Let me know if you can't hear me. Um, yeah, effectively, what? can you hear me? That was a joke. That was a joke. Sorry. I didn't see your sarcasm flag go up. Um, yeah, like hopefully it would be effective, or the UFC effectively forum shop, you know, figured out which jurisdiction was going to allow it and which jurisdiction would allow as much uh, bandwidth as, as they could. Uh, we started the first event back was a series of three events in Jacksonville in April, mid-April. Um, and the, interestingly, those were the least stringent uh, COVID guidelines. Uh, people tested and they got there. They were just in the regular hotel. Um, I booked the Jennifer, hotel. The audio, is, the audio is still Oh no. I, I and don't and one of my it. former students is blaming my sarcasm on cutting your <laughs> audio out. So. I think, I think the former student is correct. Um, <laughs> anyhow, so the, the ancillary issues, the travel, the weight cuts, the coaches not having gyms available was the biggest issue for the fighters themselves and the UFC's safeguards for the testing. Um, the testing itself was continuous and comprehensive, but the isolations were not until recently. So. Thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. Um, let me go to my uh, former fellow undrafted free agent, Eric. And Eric, tell us both, uh, I want to hear your perspective on, on just how things have changed in your role in the, in the Center for Sport at, at Tulane, and then also putting your former NFL player hat on, what is your perspective on the NFL trying to return in the middle of a, of a pandemic? And, and then we'll I'll have some follow-up questions based on the, the chat after that. Well, no, first of all, thank you for having me on. Um, I think we weren't exempt from what happened with most organizations. Um, we had uh, parts of our operations suspended and postponed. Um, our clinical operations uh, services, we have two main contracts, one with the uh, trust powered by the NFLPA and one with the NFL uh, through the NFL Player Care Foundation. Uh, individuals typically come down, they fly in, uh, come down to our clinic that's dedicated to them in New Orleans uh, with travel uh, being limited, with anxiety. Obviously that was halted. Um, we had to now uh, just rely on individuals that were in driving distance to come to our clinic. So from a contractual standpoint, our whole purpose was to keep our contracts moving. Uh, we knew that there was uh, players out there that still needed to be cared for from a clinical standpoint. Um, I think it was really engaging with those individuals and finding avenues to engage with them to make sure that they understood how they could get down to our clinic, how uh, they could go through the process still and still uh, have a safe, uh, reliable appointment. Um, it was challenges on our uh, NFL player carry end where we travel to uh, different cities typically to do uh, cardiovascular and prostate screenings. Um, that program has been halted for the time being. We're still uh, trying to research avenues of how we can go to different cities, especially some of the cities that high, have high, higher spikes in the, the virus, um, to go there to still serve those individuals. Um, but I think from a standpoint from the center, it's really forced us to uh, think creatively, like many of you have said, about engaging the different populations we serve. Uh, from an educational standpoint, a lot of this stuff has been Zoom, um, you know, limited, limited meetings, but a lot of the virtual education pieces that were there, um, focusing on some of the issues around the virus uh, with mental health, especially with some of our uh, higher risk populations. From a research end as well, we're, we're trying to really find different avenues to continue some of our research from a cardiovascular standpoint, from aging. Uh, also, we have a brain bank. Um, and it sounds odd, but uh, unfortunately, we had individuals that have passed away. They've donated their brain tissue to us. But there's, there's challenges in getting those uh, items delivered to us, getting a diener out to the locations to extract the brain tissue. So just really trying to find creative ways to continue our contracts and keep things moving. And just, I guess, to your 
point of uh, the former player hat, which I've taken off, I have took off a long, long time ago. And in, in my slimmer days, I was a player, as I always say. Um, I think as a player, individuals are itching to get back, uh, itching to get back to some type of normalcy. Um, you know, being in the locker room, being around the guys, being around the game that they love. I think the challenge is, is uh, the anxiety, the unknown uh, uh, planning uh, around some of these aspects, um, some of the things that's happened with MLB, uh, flare-ups with the, you know, people testing positive. Um, from a football standpoint, it's full contact. It, to practice uh, efficiently, it's a full contact sport. To prepare for the season, you must have that contact leading up to the season. Uh, if you don't, there's some other I issues with individuals getting hurt, um, individuals uh, not performing at the, the ca capacity they would normally perform to, um, the cancellation of the preseason. Um, now that's costing individuals jobs, some of those borderline individuals that um, really needed that uh, to be on film, really needed to be in front of the coaches, uh, don't have that opportunity. So it's a larger uh, impact, not only on the player, but also the families as well. Um, and I really, it's a, it's a house of cards. You remove one or something, one thing happens and it's a domino effect and the whole thing falls apart. So if we don't approach this the right way and do things the right, uh, in the right manner from a safety standpoint, um, we'll, we'll have some bigger issues. Thanks, Eric. Uh, so l let me go to the uh, some of the chat questions, and there is a lot of overlap in in the questions. So I'm going to try to synthesize the questions from uh, Jared. And I apologize if I got any names wrong here. Jared, Jared Ryback, David Price. I assume this is not the David Price, the Major League Baseball pitcher who opted out of the season this year, but let me know if it is. Uh, Mike Stevenson, Tom Karens, and Joel Silver Shine, and the the broad question is: We're less than a week into the Major League Baseball season. The Major League Baseball players did not want to do a bubble because, unlike the TBT, for example, the NBA season that only has eight games left for the regular season, they're they're trying to do a sixty-game season in Major League Baseball. And then playoffs and players didn't want to be away from their families for that long, among other reasons. So they are, and rather than do one or two sites, they are going from city to city, state to state. And there has already been an outbreak in the, the Marlins and multiple games have been canceled. So for a sport like the NFL that, plans to operate outside a bubble as well, at least for now. Uh, what, are, what do we think are the chances that they can pull it off? And I'll, and I'll ask Greg to chime in on this too. What are the chances that they can pull it off outside of a bubble? Or is it, it's inevitable, we know that some players are going to test positive. I don't think anyone expected an outbreak within one team this quickly. So what does it mean for the NFL, NHL, and, and the, the collision in contact sports? Dan, you're on mute, but go ahead if you want to jump in. Gabe, I think what I would say is that it's pretty clear that there must have been somebody on the Marlins that was symptomatic and that was transmitting that in a, in a super spreader environment. Um, the individuals that we tested positive, I think we had four individuals at uh, the Columbus uh, facility that we had each were asymptomatic and we didn't learn of any subsequent positive tests as a result of that. And so it seems clear to me that there was some lack of education um, either on behalf of the Marlins staff, major league baseball, um, somebody dropped the ball when it comes to informing people of what the dangers are, particularly if you're symptomatic with the virus. And so as a result of that, you know, I don't see a scenario even under which um, everybody starts testing negative within the next three days that you can permit that team to play at any point in the next 14 days, everywhere they go, every individual that they contact um, is going to be potentially exposed. And so if the goal is to minimize uh, transmission outside of the circle that you're competing in, 
Um, there's just no way, especially in the CDC recommendations, that you're supposed to not only quarantine, but self-isolate, which means that you stay in your room on your own. You have meals delivered to you. You don't interact with any other human being for a period of 14 days uh, after a positive test. There's just no way that you can compete after that. And so from that perspective, I, I don't, I'm skeptical about whether the NFL can actually proceed if they don't at least have team-wide quarantines or team-wide bubbles. And what that essentially means is you have to be alone and only interact with your teammates. And you have to be willing to undertake that or else you know, you're, you're running the risk of having something like that happen. Locker rooms in particular, if you look at when the European leagues came back, particularly in soccer and in uh, Germany in basketball, um, they eliminated the use of locker rooms. There's a reason for that, <laughs> you know, like as much as athletes and I, having been one myself, as much as you love that locker room interaction, that's one of the most dangerous places that you can be is inside of a locker room, especially if you know that not everyone is quarantined. So we eliminated them. We didn't have any locker rooms. We had curtains that, that framed our court and you couldn't see it, but just off to the side, we had other court curtained off areas that were wide open just in the off chance that something could happen. And so for me, I, I'm, I'm skeptical, um, to be totally honest, that unless there's a serious effort to quarantine teams themselves, that they could do it. If they do that, then I think they can, in turn, um, compete in, in an inter-city basis, but they have to have some level of, of um, self-quarantine amongst the team itself. Thanks, Dan. That's... That's a great perspective. And, and, and I will say part of the question was also what, what can we learn from the Korean Baseball League and, and that they've been able to successfully pull it off. And if you look at the, the latest round of testing from our domestic pro leagues, so the NBA, and, and I don't, this, there may be more recent information, but what I've seen, zero out of the last 348 tests are positive. Uh, NHL, two out of 800 are positive. MLS, zero out of 884 are positive and WNBA seven out of, out of 137 positive. And then you look at the Marlins. Um, and and there, there's, I don't know if this is true, but certainly what's being reported is that the players were able to make the decision about whether they wanted to play their game on Sunday night after, I don't know if it was a positive test or there was just a presumed positive. And they decided to, and the end up, sorry, NWSL zero positives as well. Um, but that, that the national, that the Marlins players were able to choose and that the Nationals players were deciding whether or not they were going to travel to Miami and, and just highlights, I think, Dan's point that we certainly cannot leave this up to the players about whether they're going to play or not. And, and this reminds me a little bit of, of concussion issues. The players want to play. We've got to take it out of their hands and, and make the decisions on on what's safest and, and, and particularly unlike a concussion, as far as I'm aware, but Greg's the expert on this, concussions aren't contagious. So it, it's not only that you're putting yourself at risk, but putting the others around you at risk and, uh, and potentially the whole league. So we'll, 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 we'll see what happens. But anyone else want to chime in on those? Go ahead, Shelly. Yeah, you know, I would just say, you know, this I think is unique when typically you look at leagues. I know as we look at other leagues, leagues are competitive. We're fighting for the same consumer, the same revenue in many instances. And so there's a lot of competition. But this is one scenario, you know, the Marlin situation is very unfortunate because when if one league fails, it affects all of us um, because, you know, they're kind of looking at it as a template. So you really are every, I think, and this is the one instance of a pandemic to say every league is rooting for each other to be successful. Yeah. We, I think the NBA was in a different place. We were finishing. I mean, this bubble is us finishing our season. We're going to have to reevaluate and figure the long term because we want to have the, the, you know, our full 82 game season when it comes back. But I just think it's unfortunate because it's going to really impact everyone as you watch these things come about. Yeah, that's a great point. And I, and I was also, I, I was nervous for sports and nervous for Dan watching the TBT because I, Me I too. know people, <laughs> yeah, I can imagine. <laughs> Uh, I, just how much pressure there was and, and again to show that it could be done and could be done in a, in a safe way obviously with with challenges um, let me let's see a, so this is a, a focus here is on pro sports but we're Tulane and and we're we have our football team doctor here and and one of the the chair of the American Athletic Conference COVID advisory committee or whatever fancy title it is. 
Um, how do we see college sports proceeding? And there, there's a point raised by Brandon Wasserman in here that for, for some college athletes, at least the safest place they can be is on campus with protocols and testing in place. But that doesn't necessarily answer what happens when the non-athlete students come back to campus and when two teams play each other when they have to travel. So Greg, let me open it to you and then anybody else who wants to chime in, feel free. You know, I, I think the Marlins really kind of opened everybody's eyes. Um, I think that the, uh, we're all watching that. Uh, we want them to be successful. Uh, to to Shelly's point, everyone's kind of rooting for each other uh, right now. Um, we're actually at the at college level, uh, not glad to see it happen, but are going to learn from it. Uh, so from that standpoint, we're glad it happened to somebody else and not us. We're sorry it happened at all, but we're going to watch what the Marlins do and what MLB does from the standpoint of how do they get through this and what do they do? You know, Dan's comment about, you know, once they're positive, you know, that's 10 days minimum uh, with at least 24 to 48 hours of being asymptomatic before they come back. All of their close contacts are 14 days. Uh, and, and there's no testing out now. You know, for a while, CDC would let you test out, uh, but now you, it's only a time uh, issue. So everyone uh, that is participating not in a bubble, uh, MLB, uh, NFL, and what college sports will be once the, the students return to campus uh, are very interested uh, in, uh, in watching this. So we don't know what's going to come from it, uh, but that's what we're, that's the concern. So we're watching them closely. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Greg. And, and let, me, let me go back to Jennifer. Let's to, we'll tempt fate with your audio. But I, I want to ask, and, and this is a question, if anyone else has thoughts, chime in as well. But what, I, what I've been thinking about through all this, and, and this is obviously not sports specific, but what is this, the silver lining from what we're going through in the last few months? And, and more specifically, what have you learned about the way you run your business that maybe you can apply when things go hopefully back to normal, whether that's a new normal or, or the old normal. But, but is, is there something where you said, you know what, I could have been doing this all along or I'm able to do this a better way. Um, and and you, know, you wear a lot of different hats and, and so I'm, I'm curious to hear what, what your experience it is, is and, and what you can learn from it. Uh, first, can you hear me? Is this better? Yes, oh, I can hear you now. Uh, Excellent. Um, I think first and foremost is making sure that your force majeure uh, provisions are tight and uh, exist. Um, Contractive has been a big deal for a lot of our sponsors. I, I think uh, like Shelley's sort of recitation of the efforts that they have taken to keep connected with their you know, other streams of income. I wish I had taken notes. I mean, I think those were were brilliant and uh, proactive. Um, and it's something that I think that we tried to do to a certain extent, you know, the, like Shelly noted, the, the sponsors are also in a terrible position, you know, and as much as our fighters, um, not knowing when they're going to fight next and, you know, not knowing what their income is going to look like, would love to have that sponsor money. You don't want to jeopardize the sponsorship relationship either between the fighter and the sponsor or the agency and the sponsor um, by insisting on um, contractual normalcy when we're in such an abnormal time. Um, effectively, we left that in all cases, we advise the clients as to what their contractual obligations are, what we think, you know, the uh, likelihood of the sponsor being amenable to change terms are, or, you know, in some cases, the, the athletes weren't willing to renegotiate any of the obligations or any of the terms. Um, I, I think in going through the process, it was such an unusual time for all of us. It was hard to be an expert in telling our clients what was going to happen. You know, we just didn't know. Um, we were scheduled to fight in, in California and, you know, the week prior that got pulled. 
Um, then we got moved to to Florida. Um, and nothing was normal, you know, so it's really hard to say what we we learned a lot of lessons and you just don't know how they're going to apply again because you hope you never have to go through a pandemic again. Um, you asked what the sort of the silver linings were. Um, to a certain extent, being on ESPN during prime time, um, you know, where, where your competition was live cornhole. Um, on the other hand, your lead-ins were live cornhole. So while you got more time and more traction and you see, you know, the, the ESPN <laughs> scrolls were fighters from the preliminary cards, they've never seen their names on ESPN before. That was a huge uh, reach out for a lot of them. Um, the numbers went up, went up precipitously, but not as much as I would have thought. And in large part, because people weren't thinking sports were on, and so they weren't watching, you know, the Cavs game that led into the USC fight. So they just continued to watch. Um, but I would say that, yeah, the, the exposure that the UFC got for successfully undertaking to start sports again um, and being on ESPN to a new audience was, was our silver lining. Yeah, I, sh I share in that silver lining for us, as I alluded to earlier, we had those windows, which we would have never been given, but the rising tide, you know, floats all ships. And if you're not watching TV because you don't think sports are on, those windows don't mean anything. I will say, though, for our June shows, we did, you know, four and a half million viewers over the course of a couple of weeks. And that's huge for us. And the half of them were new viewers. So for me, it was and maybe, Jennifer, you saw this, too. It's just new audiences that we were able to reach that we never thought we could reach before which is huge. You know, that's exactly what we need for the sport to grow and sort of gain traction as a um, recognized major sport. So. Yeah, great. Thanks, guys. That's uh, well, another question. This one from Justin Berger. So we've, um, we've seen repercussions for NBA players who've left the bubble. And there's a well-known story now of a, a player who uh, in Atlanta broke protocol. But today, the University of Arizona football team suspended a player for breaking COVID protocol. Um, this is for, for specifically for Dan or Coley, but anyone can feel free to jump in. But did you guys have um, have any pro policies for participants who broke pro protocol? And more generally, how should we think about punitive measures for those who don't follow COVID-related policies? We we did our our plan basically called for anyone that left the bubble to be eliminated from the tournament. Um, and so we had the luxury of being a single elimination event where everyone that enters TBT is not an employee or even a subcontractor, their entrance and contest. And so from a legal perspective, we can basically set the rules as we want to set them. Um, you know, as it pertains to leagues, they have to balance a lot of different um, obligations as it pertains to CBAs, uh, individual contracts and things along those lines, even within the UFC. I know that those fighters are under contract with the UFC as well. So there are obligations on that front. From a college athletic standpoint, um, the young man today that got suspended from Arizona State uh, sounds like he also got his scholarship reduced, and um, you know that to me is a, is a real difficult situation for him. I don't understand exactly what transpired there. It does sound pretty draconian, but um, you can't mess around uh, when it comes to the risk that you're taking, uh, particularly when you start looking at the dollars that are involved. Frankly. Uh, for for sports, it's just this too uh, expensive of, of a proposition to have one individual uh, potentially not comply with what you're asking them to do, and then potentially you know ruin the whole thing. Yeah, thanks, Dan. I'm, I'm going to do one last question and then turn it back over to to Greg. Um, and this is a a question for. Let me see, there's a lot of pressure to pick one last question among all that are here. Um, so it's a question from, from Evan, and what, what are the implications for services like fantasy sports, DraftKings, et cetera, when a team like the Marlins or others end up not playing games or key players have to sit out for a number of games? And, and I, I, I wanna generalize the question a little bit more just beyond fantasy, fantasy sports or daily fantasy sports or, or sports gambling, but in terms of relationships with sponsors and your ticket holders, if they are paying to see the Cleveland Cavaliers and then the team that is on the court is, think about the Brooklyn Nets, the team that they have in, in the bubble, 
people haven't heard of most of those players. They're incredible players, but people, it's not Kevin Durant. If, you, if you're Harvey. a Nets fan, you've heard of the players. So let's. All right. Fair enough. Fair enough. Fair enough. Um, fine. So my question was terrible. I withdraw. Uh, so it's, but how do you handle that and all the sort of cascading collateral impacts that the players sitting out or teams not being able to play might have? And, that, and that's for, for all of you and Shelly, how you're reaching out to, to sponsors and, and how your staff is reaching out to season ticket holders, how you sell in the middle and contract in the middle of so much uncertainty. Yeah, so it's a good question. Look, when you talk about contract, it's like I said, it, it, we luckily have very strong force majeure language, but it really goes out the window to a certain degree when I say, like for us, when we were finishing our season, it's like watching, going to a the movie theater, watching 80% of the movie, and then it just cuts off, right? So the movie theater is going to say, well, you had an experience, you had a great time, you kind of got it. So we'll just give you a credit for the next, another movie on us. And then the customer might say, well, no, give me my money back. Like it's ruined now. I don't know the end of the movie, right? So where do you land in that? And it's subjective. It's, we have language, to, I mean, in our contract to lock us in, but am I going to jeopardize X amount of dollars for this portion of our season when, and risk the renewal for the next six years of a partnership? And the answer is no, I won't do that. Um, so I think when you, you bring this, it's the same with fans. Um, it becomes a trust factor. It becomes a relationship factor of listening. Content is going to be different right now. You know, we're look, we're one in three chances of having number one draft pick next year in our lottery and our draft. That's what we're talking about right now. Um, you know, there, you're going to see things differently. Um, and I think the good thing is that most partners and most fans understand that. They understand that this is not normal. It's not normal sitting at your house and executing all of your business and, and everything else. So I think the good thing is everybody's going through this. I remember going through like the Gulf oil spill or Hurricane Katrina, like it affected Southern businesses and states more than other regions, right? This affects everybody. And I just think that because of that, we're getting um, a lot more flexibility from our fans. Um, and by that, we're just trying to do more with them right now also. We're going over and beyond to say, look, we're gonna be flexible. We don't have any leverage right now. <laughs> we don't know what, the, I can't tell you what the next two, the next two months is, are gonna, um, have uh, in store. So just work with us on a, you know, like a, a week by week basis and we'll get through this together. So it's just, I would say flexibility is where we're coming from that and trying to over deliver on content, especially digital and social content. Great. Thanks, Shelly. Any, any last words from our other panelists? Eric, I'm going to put you on the spot. What, what are the chances that the NFL plays a full season this year? In my opinion, very slim chance. Yeah, very slim. And, uh, you know, just to kind of add on what Shelly was saying, I think on the flip side from the player standpoint is as as more positive cases occur in these different leagues, you'll get more of these players opting out and choosing not to play. Um, and it's, I think there's a, a positive in that as well from a, a media spin of um, – Leagues are going to have to appropriately know how to communicate the safety of the players over some of the economic pieces that are in play because these individuals aren't on a team. Team, team chemistry is not there. They may not win. Sponsorship may be down. So I think there's a flip side to all that. But I, I highly doubt there's going to be a full season. Thank you for your optimism, um, but also your <laughs> Try to be your, your honesty. Uh, let, let me thank you very quickly to all the panelists. This was awesome. I appreciate you taking the time. Let me flip it back over to Greg for closing remarks. No, I, I as we bring this episode of plug in, I want to thank all the panelists. This is obviously something that we could have uh, uh, gone on for quite some time. Uh, maybe if we'd had someone else asking the questions, it would have been even easier. But uh, if, it, if it has to be Gabe, then it has to be Gabe. Uh, but I want to thank all of you all uh, for participating uh, tonight uh, and this evening with everything that you all have, the insights. Very interesting. Thank you. Uh, I guess I have to thank Gabe for uh, hosting uh, with me. Uh, and I want to thank uh, the, the special projects and development folks who are all behind the scenes with all their help and support. Uh, for uh, tonight's event. Uh, I want to thank everybody for attending. Uh, stay healthy and stay safe. Uh, and good night to everybody. Thank you all. Good night. Thanks, all.